All right, welcome to a uh, third day of our fusion training. And uh, today we're going to talk about how we actually get our designs to our shop bot. Fusion calls that uh, manufacturing. Uh, so that's what we're going to focus on a little bit on the manufacturing and how to create the toolpaths within fusion. Uh, but we're really more going to work on how to get the drawings out of Fusion so we could get those over into uh, VCarve Pro or Aspire. The uh, tool pathing within uh, Fusion in Autodesk product, it works great. It is a uh, very solid and uh, the challenge that they have is, or that we have uh, using Fusion is getting all the parts laid out as if they were on a sheet. Um, so the manufacturing in the tool pathing side of Fusion is more geared and set up for machining just an individual product um, and not taking products that uh, need to fit on a sheet. So uh, more uh, geared towards a mill um, rather than a CNC machine that is going to cut out uh, the products out of a sheet of material. But with uh, all of that done on uh, this Thursday, uh, we're going to uh, take a complete start to finish uh, project uh, using Fusion. Uh, that is going to be a review of our last three days. And it will be a start to finish all the way through to the tool pathing and creating the product. Uh, the product that we're going to create is uh, the ShopBot 3-axis Z-zeroing plate. So uh, everybody will learn how to be able to make their own uh, if you uh, like that item or not. So um, we're going to get into it. Uh, today uh, we have always been so far working right here in the design section within our uh, workspace. Um, so this was a, the item that we first designed last week and created that. So if we want to be able to create the tool paths for this item, uh, there's two ways about doing it. One, we could export the drawing out to VCarve Pro, or we could do the tool pathing right here within Fusion. So the first thing that uh, we're going to take a look at is separating the model and the design aspect of Fusion to what is called a drawing. So a drawing is a, gonna be the two-dimensional representation of this item. So to get it from Fusion to Vectric, we're not going to export the model. We need to export the drawing. The um, drawing, as uh, we learned uh, last week or briefly touched on it, uh, are different items that we have here. We have their design, that's where we've actually in and designing our product. Then we have our drawings and manufacturing. So manufacture is where we create the tool paths. We'll look at that a little bit after we learn about the drawings. The drawing is what you would see as uh, say an engineering drawing to where it is uh, you know, all dimensioned out um, to be able to fabricate the item and be able to get a two-dimensional representation that we're able to print out and view. Uh, but we're also able to take that drawing and export it as a DXF file to be able to import into Vectric. So even though we do have, under the design as, uh, product here, we do have the ability to export this as a uh, different types. Uh, so we can see here's a DXF file right here. This DXF file is not the same DXF file or the type of DXF file that we can import into a Vectric. The DXF file and all the files that we have listed here, and again, that is under design, for under the design aspect of it, when we are going to file, save, or export, that is really not going to export a file that we could use directly in vCarve Pro. To be able to get a file, this file, from here to vCarve Pro, we have to create a drawing of this. And to create a drawing, there's a couple ways of doing it. One, in our design, just selecting design and coming down here and select from design, meaning that we are going to create a drawing 
from this design that we've created, or you could right click on the model and create a new drawing from the design that you're selecting. So right now we'll do it both ways. Uh, we have the model already open in design. So I'm gonna to go to the design and select to do a drawing from this design. And we're able to specify what sheet size paper we want. We don't really care about that. Um, and what standards, I don't care about any of that because all we are doing is going to use this as a 2D representation to be able to export this out. So I'm just going to say OK. And it opens up a uh, little dialog that is uh, going to allow us to select what view or orientation we want to create this uh, drawing for. So we see the appearance right here. And right now it is doing the front of our product. Um, so the resolution isn't great until after you import it, but we can see this is like the side view of it. That is not what we want. We want to be able to orient this from the top. So I'm going to select the top view. The next thing we want to really pay attention to, and this is one that gets, um, you know, a lot of folks in trouble when they're uh, going out is the scale. Um, the scale right now is one to five, which is, uh, you know, scaling it down to be able to fit on paper. We, we, we want the scale to be a one to one. Uh, so we're just going to select that scale option and change that to a one to one. And we see that that kind of scales bigger. Um, so at this point, I'm just going to click and place it on the, the sheet. Yes, it is farther out on the or on our sheet than you might want. Definitely not what you would do for printing, but we're not going to print this. So once that is placed, selecting OK, now we have our two-dimensional representation of the product. So I'm just going to select the title block and remove the title block to delete that, and also deleting the outside border to only have the drawing of the two-dimensional drawing. At this point, you would go up to the output, uh, not, not to save, because again, file save is only going to save the three-dimensional uh, part of it. And you can see we don't have an export under file uh, save when we are in the drawing section. So if we go to output, and we want to output this to a DXF file. Now there is uh, an option for DWG. The DWG option is not going to import into uh, vCarve Pro. Uh, so you want to select the output sheet as a DXF. Give it a name. Uh, we'll just call that uh, it was base. To keep the naming uh, convention somewhat the same and we'll say save to that. So that created the DXF drawing that we will need to be able to import into vCarve Pro. Also want to note that we have an untitled or an unsaved file here. This two-dimensional representation is and, is and will always be linked to our main model. So just uh, to quickly show if we could do some whole callouts or cutting callouts on this, um, that is uh, specifying it to be a one and a half inch circle. It's dimensioned. I'm going to save this drawing now. So we will save, and I am going to. And it is giving it the name of base, which it is uh, the drawing that is derived from that base. And it's the drawing, so we'll say save. And it adds that here to the two-dimensional uh, view. Just to show how everything kind of automatically links up and how everything is connected, I've closed that drawing. And if we remember, we have our timeline down across the bottom. And if I want to change the size of these holes, that is uh, done so through the sketch. And I can see that this is the sketch and hovering over top of it is highlighting those circles. So I'm going to double click there and there is the one and a half inch diameter. If I really wanted those holes to be one inch, we'll say one 
And if you remember, we have all of these holes constrained to be equal to the first one. So all of the holes have resized automatically. We'll select finish sketch. And now when we come back in, do need to save this. And now if we open up our drawing uh, once more, and we'll get a warning here. And what that warning is, is saying that our drawing no, ma no longer matches our base design. And we also have the little, you know, warning message here. So I'm just gonna click on that and it updates. So we can see that those circles changed in diameter and our value, dimension value also automatically changed. So this is a, uh, a very nice way to keep all the drawings and everything kind of linked together and fusion and the constraints and everything that it has just automatically changes everything across, uh, you know, across all the dimensions. So now I'm gonna take a look and open up a new version of Aspire. VCarve Pro works just the same way. I'm working in two dimensions, so I'm not worried about three-dimensional um, work here. So uh, VCarve Pro and Aspire, as far as uh, we're concerned today, they are identical. We're not using any of the Aspire features. So to cut this out, we're going to uh, create a new file and the size of the material is going to be 24 in the X, 18 in the Y, and the material thickness is 0.5. Setting the Z zero to the material surface and the X and Y zero to the lower left. Once that is all set, I could say, okay. We now have our material laid out and going up to file and import vectors. And there is our base DXF drawing and selecting open. A few things that we have to do to be able to cut this, uh, even though it is a representation of what that product is, we're not quite set up to be able to just cut this. As you uh, notice, when I select some of these items, they are not joined together. Selecting this item here, and there is not just a vector that goes around the outside representing the outside to be able to profile cut this. So we have to break this apart a little bit and join it back together. And there is still a little bit of work we have to do to create the geometry that is suitable for machining. So to be able to do this, a um, couple ways of doing it. First, um, I'm gonna correct this issue that we have here just using the scissor tool to be able to cut on the outside. And the scissors uh, sometimes automatically joins things for us, but not always. So now with that cut and separated, it's gonna do some sweep selects, holding the shift key down to select the outer perimeter and typing the J on the keyboard is gonna open up our join function and click join. We now have a shape that we're able to select for the outside boundary. The one thing that we lost by trimming that away is what vectors are we going to use or how are we gonna create the rabbit or the pocket that is on the outside of this. If we go back to the three-dimensional view and see that we have to lock it down on top of that. So to be able to create that, I am going to use a rectangle tool. Several ways of doing it. We have a left side and a right side to do, so I'll do one side differently from the other. So on the left side, I'm gonna use the draw rectangle tool and use the snap functions to snap to the lower left corner. And I'm gonna click and then use the upper right corner of that rectangle as its opposite side of the rectangle. So selecting and dragging that and snapping it at that location right there. Now, we're still not quite set up, even though we have a rectangle there, that we're able to use 
to be able to pocket out, I really want to have that rectangle a little bit bigger um, because if I use this to toolpath, we're going to get an inside radius here. So if I was to toolpath this, I'm gonna do this area here, I'm gonna come in and do a pocketing toolpath to a depth of 0.25. Selecting a quarter inch cutter is already selected and we'll click calculate. And we can see that that pockets it out. We'll do the same thing for the outer border. Do a profile toolpath of this one cutting to a depth of 0.51, just a little bit deeper than the material, cutting to the outside, and clicking Calculate, getting a warning that I'm gonna cut all the way through. That is okay. So now the reason I was wanted to quickly do that is just to demonstrate what happens and the reason that uh, having this rectangle be there is not going to work for us. To view the tool paths and toggle the solid versus wireframe, right now what we're viewing is the wireframe. This is the lines that are representing the center path of the bit. We could change that to solid. That represents then the full width of the bit and see that how this bit is going to get around. So first of all, um, we are not going to be cutting this area here at all. Um, simply because that cutter cannot get into that corner and this rectangle that we have selected is containing that bit within that selected vector. So first thing we have to do is increase the width of this rectangle and to do that I'm just going to drag that out a little bit coming over to the right side and we'll click calculate or recalculate the button the little calculator there. So now we do have that being completely cut out. I'm gonna hide the uh, profile cutter. We can see that it is uh, radius out here, not being cut, but that is okay. We're on the outside of this uh, rectangle. The other item and area that we have is this area right in here. Uh, that's also going to create uh, an issue. So let's uh, just take a look at the preview and what is happening there. So I'm gonna select that and preview all the tool paths. And that is what we will end up being left with. That is not what we want. So I wanna increase the height of this rectangle as well. So this rectangle here, and if you drag it from the top, the bottom is not moving. So if you, as you drag, if you hold the shift key down as you move, you see the bottom half is, it is kind of being mirrored. Um, both sides are moving equally. One thing that I like to do, even though this setting right here with that rectangle being set right there is sufficient for us to get completely around um, and get that completely cut out as we will see in the preview. That did remove that, but that might leave us a little bit of an unbalanced type of cut that's happening here. So when we go to profile around this, we're taking out material and not taking out material. So that you want to keep that bit somewhat loaded up as much as you can. So what I like to do is take the rectangle and uh, something in a situation like this, if feasible, uh, of course, if this is, you know, 60 inches high, I wouldn't do this, uh, but an extra half of an inch uh, going up and bottom and the bottom isn't going to take that much longer in machining and it's going to give us a little bit better uh, finish uh, in part sizing and everything else. So just extending it out past the actual cutting area of that profile does make a difference. So again, we'll just preview or recalculate and we see that is all the way up and we can preview what this is gonna look like. And of course, uh, nothing really changes is the part other than we see that we've machined out on the outside of that part now. 
So that is uh, kind of one way to add a rectangle to the, the section here where we're just using a snap from top to bottom. Another uh, way uh, to do this, and I've done both, um, we are square corners here. So again, just using a rectangle, rather than snapping from this point to here, I'm gonna go straight up from bottom to top which now I have a Y value of three inches. The rectangle is three inches, but an infinitely small width in the X. So we don't really have a rectangle. So at this point, I do know that the dimension of this part uh, was three eighths of an inch. So the X value that I'm gonna enter in is going to be plus an eighth of an inch. So let's go 0.5. And now the X or the Y is going to be made from top to bottom. So I will select create. And that just created that rectangle right where we wanted and also added uh, that little bit that we needed to over, over cut there. And again, I'm just gonna stretch that up a little bit, holding the shift key down to make sure that the bottom side and the top side are um, getting uh, specified. So there we have um, the rectangle on the left side and the right side. And to create the tool pathing for this, we'll right or double click. Just gonna hold the shift key down to make sure that the other one is also selected and click calculate. So that is uh, kind of setting up and being able to create a tool path from the, uh, and exporting out of Fusion and into um, Aspire. We'll go back in and take a look at uh, Fusion and export and bring in a few more parts. I'm just gonna pause for a second and uh, take, a, take a read on our chat. So yes, you are, you are correct um, that we do not have to extend it out past, absolutely. That is really not doing anything to improve the, the part itself. What it is doing is um, going to aid in the load of the cutter. So just imagine uh, the cutter coming through, we're cutting out material, and as we're cutting out material, moving at a uh, whatever our feed rate is, we're loaded up so there is uh, pressure and tension on that cut uh, and on that, that cutter. So we have a little bit of you know, tool deflection, uh, the bit is flexing just a little bit, uh, just all this little stuff that adds up uh, to tension. And as we make this final uh, release into an area, um, let's put it like this way, if I didn't have it extended out past, we are fully loaded up and now all of a sudden we kind of boom, no more load. Um, it like bounces in all of that tension and uh, strain that we had on the bit is now gone. So imagine and picture uh, what it is um, pushing uh, some lumber um, or using a bandsaw. And as you're cutting the bandsaw and pushing it through, what happens when you cut all the way through and you finish that wood? That the pressure that you're putting on it, that all of a sudden your hands kind of lunge forward as it cuts out because your hands are under, under load pushing the bit through the cutter. Um, so the same thing is kind of happening here. Um, and that is the reason that I like to pull out, if I can, um, and have the lines be straight. That way as we won't get any kind of mark or line from the bit deflection that we have from when it's going from load to an unloaded uh, cutter. So uh, just something to think about there. Um, again, you are right, it is not needed to make the part, it just helps with the edge quality a little bit. So coming back into Fusion, so let's uh, do the, uh, for the foot, which was the bottom right side of this. So with selecting that, going to say insert or create a drawing from 
design. And the same dialog opens up as we did before for us to select the view and the orientation. I want to do it from the top, setting the scale as a one to one. And once that's in place, we'll say OK. And notice that it did give us the hidden line view. Uh, and that's where we had the holes uh, that was drilled down from the top. We're going to end up ignoring and deleting those. Um, but that's, uh, that's all right that they're there. We'll right click and just, again, delete um, the border. I'm certain there's a way to start with it as a blank sheet. I just have been lazy in setting that up, so I haven't done so. Going up to output, save this as a DXF. I'll name that to be the same name that I have uh, for the model, just to keep things straight and clear. And again, coming over to Aspire or VCarve Pro, coming into import vectors. And as they're brought in, they are selected. So I'm just going to click it one more time to be able to move it off of the main model. And at this point, zooming it around, and I am going to come in and remove the unneeded areas. Do a select all a J on the keyboard for join, select join, then close. So that is joined together. Before I get really into the tool pathing, coming back into Fusion, I could save that if I wanted to. I'm just going to say no because it really wasn't that hard to really duplicate saving that. Right click on the head section, do a new drawing from design. Again, setting the view to the top and the scale. I'm going to change this just to point out another way of doing it and showing how this scale works. So right now I'm doing a one to two. And we'll say OK. And again, just going to delete the outer border here. But it's going to quickly put in a dimension of that. And that's a total of seven inches. So this time when we go to output, as a DXF, and this is the head. Coming into Aspire and doing import vectors in the head. Now this is, uh, again, the reason that uh, it does get some people in trouble. Um, as uh, we see, this is brought in to a, uh, not to scale. I should have selected everything before I moved it or before I uh, off clicked just so I can move that around. Sometimes a challenge to be able to select objects. Just going to move it up out of the way. Now, I'm going to take a look at what actual size it was brought in. And knowing that I put that dimension in there just so I would remember what size we needed this to be. So in the X direction, this does need to be seven inches. If we select both of these objects, we could see down here the width from our selected objects or our bounding box of our selecting objects is three and a half inches and one and a half in the Y direction. This was half of what we needed to be. We really needed to be seven inches. Still an easy fix. We just have to remember to fix it before we toolpath it. So I am going to delete that uh, dimension because we don't need it. Selecting the object and using the scale. And knowing that the X, I could use a, um, a percentage, but I'm going to use an exact number because I know that X does need to be seven inches. Selecting seven inches, then apply. We now have that object set to be seven by four, which is the size that we want it to be. So if you remember, uh, when we started this project um, last Tuesday, when we were starting the sketch, I was always drawing that sketch and starting that sketch on the top view 
Um, and the reason I did that from the top view is so when we are creating these drawings and uh, creating toolpaths even from within Fusion, that it is an easy representation to what we are and how we're gonna have it oriented to be able to cut this. Uh, so even though I have this part set as, that is the top, oriented to the top, the actual top of this part is, you know, on the, the top edge. Um, but I like to lay it out in the orientation that we are going to cut. So the last and final part that we need uh, is the rod. And I'm not going to save this. Just down here, just going to right click and say, new drawing from design. Now this is one where I've I just said I, I like to draw them oriented from the top. Um, as what we see here, uh, this is the orientation that we want it, but it's not how I need to have it oriented to cut. And uh, I'll put uh, that here just so we could see what I mean by that. So that is um, that hole that we had on the bottom. We're not able to get that angle cut here. Uh, so that's really not what I want to do. Um, I'm going to do a front view of that. So I'm just going to close our drawing and do another new from design. And this is actually from the front view is uh, how we want it to have oriented. And I'm going to change that scale to a one to one just so I don't have to scale it up in the V carve. We'll say OK there. And again, just remove our title block and our border to be able to have just the part that we want to export to a DXF. Call it what it is, going into Aspire, import the rod. So this is a fairly simple uh, one. Uh, I am going to click on it and move it off of the main area. That is the hidden line of the hole that we have drawn. So I'm going to select and delete that. We'll um, do that as a, a secondary uh, hand drill operation. Selecting the, all of it, J for join, and join that together. Now I want to make a duplicate of that. So to be able to make a copy, a couple ways of doing this is I could select it again, hold the control key down as I drag and drop. It makes a duplicate copy of that. We could also do a control C to copy, move the part, control V, and it puts another part back in its same spot. So now we have all of the items in our design that we need to have toolpath. So at this point, is just going through and kind of laying it out on the material the best way that I think it would fit. Um, I even want to do a rotation of some of these parts. Look at that, I didn't finish doing that one. So going to select all of that, join that together. At this point, we're just a lot of kind of drag and drop and make sure that we don't have any collisions. Yes, we could use the um, nesting tool for this, um, but uh, for a small project, oh, look at the scaling, I didn't want to do that. Um, just gonna rotate that around a little bit to get a best fit for material that I could fit. So. Probably still a little bit of uh, tweaking that I could do to get that to be a uh, better fit and better laid out, but that is it. Um, so at this point, um, go through and create the tool paths uh, for this. Um, a few things and challenges that we're going to end up with uh, that we'll see along the way. Uh, we already have two of them completed and the profile. 
uh, to help organize since we're going to have multiple tool paths here, even with the default names, it's going to become confusing. So I'm going to right click on the profile, which I know is the outside cut and select rename. I'm going to call that cut. And I don't think we have to use multiple bits, but I'm just going to put that's a quarter inch, uh, two five for the bit. This is a pocket. So I'm going to right click and rename. I'm going to leave it named as pocket, but I'm going to uh, specify maybe the depth at point or at two five with a two five cutter. Now this is my way of naming things. So I understand what they are really has nothing to do with cutting, just organization on my part of it and my side. So I understand when I come back to this uh, another couple weeks from now, I'll understand what's really happening with these tool paths. Creating the file now or the tool paths for this section here. Now this is where we're going to run into a little bit of a problem. Um, so I'm going to do a profile tool path and a cut on the inside total depth of 5.1 and P interior 2.5 and calculate. Say okay. So it, it didn't give us any warning, uh, but when we go to preview this, that's certainly not what we asked it to do. Um, why do I have holes? What, what is the reason that it just drilled holes? Well, what it is doing is um, it, it plunged in uh, at, at the ends here, but it, what it's saying is it, the bit really can't fit, even though that we do have a quarter inch wide slot with a quarter inch bit, in reality, in life, it should fit uh, and would work. But to get a good quality edge, we want to be able to have material removed from the same direction. So if we did this as a tool path um, on the line or straight down the center of this, with a quarter inch cutter, yes, we are going to get a quarter inch wide slot. But what that means is one edge, in this case, uh, the left side of this edge is going to get a conventional path cutting the right side of this uh, slot is going to get a climb mill section. And as we've learned over the uh, course of owning a CNC, we know direction makes a difference in the quality of cut. So depending on what material and how you're cutting this out would depend on what type of uh, direction you're going with. Um, I cut my first one out of HDPE, uh, a plastic, so I chose to do a conventional if you were cutting this out of lumber, then we would have to do this, or I would recommend climb. Uh, so to get around and make sure that that fits, a couple ways of doing it, I could resize those rectangles a little bit to make them fit. Or we could use the offset allowance within the tool path, and I'm going to set it to be a minus 0 0.001, just a thousandth of an inch, and to go with the quality of cut, I really should go a little bit more than that, um, but I'm just going to leave it to say it's going to be good and calculate and say okay. So we can now see that that cutter completely goes around and with the solid um, turned on as well, when we zoom in, we could see that it is extending out beyond our selected vector by that thousandths of an inch. So when we get through cutting this, our total width of the rectangle is going to be two thousandths bigger than what we specified. Uh, so just keep in mind that two thousandths of an inch is uh, two thirds the thickness of a piece of paper. So uh, I'm not uh, worried about that. Um, that is okay. So just do a quick uh, preview. I reset it and do a quick preview of what we've done so far. That is good. I don't like how this is uh, happening right there. Something is uh, not quite going on right. Um, so I'm going to turn on all the tool paths. So see what's happening here is 
we've moved this part from when we originally had it toolpath and we've never recalculated it. So this was originally sitting up here and that is where it was when we created the profile toolpath. We've moved it, so what we really need to do is recalculate the cut toolpath. So I'm just gonna double click and calculate. I could have also just clicked the recalculate button. Again, reset the preview and preview all of that. Same thing happening there. So this is the reason that calculate or recalculate all the toolpaths is going to help prevent um, any kind of errors or mistake in having a toolpath that was calculated on a part that was in a previous position. So doing that again, reset the preview, preview all of these toolpaths, it's looking good. Uh, the final thing that we need to do is in the cut toolpath, we need to add in the remainder items, clicking calculate, and do a reset and a preview all. So there are our final products and, and cutting. So now in a uh, virtual world, they cut, everything looks good. Um, in reality, we would have a tough time actually cutting this out. Um, mainly we got a couple thin slots here that um, are completely open and there's going to be no way that that part is going to be held in place. Um, so we really should have some tabs in this. I also want to be able to move it to where we're not cutting off of the edge because I would hold this down with maybe a couple screws on the outside uh, parameters of this. Um, so even though we kind of are in here fitting nicely, we, we have some rearranging uh, to do to be able to get this to a actual cuttable layout. Um, even if you had a, you know, a vacuum uh, system, the vacuum system is still not going to be able to hold those two parts down um, without them uh, bouncing around and sliding around. So that is um, some work to do on that, uh, but hopefully everybody is understanding uh, about the tool pathing and understanding that. So remember when we created these files in this assembly, uh, this is the main assembly that we've locked it all together. Um, this is uh, the assembly of all the individual components uh, that we have made up. Um, that warning was because of the whole size has changed uh, and you can see that that automatically changed in our assembly here. So to create a, a toolpath, let's just focus on uh, creating a toolpath just for this uh, foot. Um, so we have this product and if we wanted to create a cutting code to be able to cut this out. We need to go to our manufacturing window. So it looks like we're still within the same process of here. We're just using the manufacturing tool now. Um, yeah, thank you about the uh, reminder on those screws uh, or the holes, um, these holes here. Uh, you're right, I should never pocket those out. Um, so anyway, we're back here uh, into um, Fusion. The first thing that we have to do is uh, create a setup uh, for, for this job and orient our product in the XYZ. So to be able to create the setup, to click the button here to create a new setup. And right at the bat, we get this, you know, the Trident, uh, this is where Fusion is saying that we are going to have X, Y, Z, zero for this part. It's not the orientation that we have in our world space. This is the machining X, Y, zero. So right now, Fusion is saying we should zero the X, Y, and Z, X and Y to the center of our part and Z to the top of the material. So notice that we also have a grayish or brown ghosty type of uh, color. That is what is called stock. Uh, stock is the material. So if you're uh, already familiar with some machining and other programs like Fusion, you're probably already familiar with them calling it stock, uh, but the stock is the material. So 
what type of uh, machining are we going to do? Uh, we are going to do milling, um, that is what we have. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the uh, cutting is. I always have set it to be milling. And where do we want to set the work coordinate system? Um, we have it to the stock uh, box. Um, we could change that anywhere we would like. And we could come in and actually select um, the world system, X, Y, and Z. Um, model origin. And so we've set it to the top of the model. And it's really not where I'd want it to be set. Um, if we had like maybe a five axis or something like that, I might want to set that. Um, we could do it to the stock point. Um, this is uh, to the material point. Uh, and again, it's setting it to there. So we could select to have it to be the bottom left of X, Y, and the Z to the top. Uh, if we select and wanted the Z0 to be at the machine bed, we would select to do the, uh, the option there. So I'm going to leave that set to the top. And now at this point, our stock and our, what it's saying is it's looking at our model and it's saying our material right now is offset by 04, 04 and the X and Y or X and Z. So to be able to cut this out, I really would probably go with a material that is say one inch bigger um, or even 0.5 of an inch bigger. And we can see that how that ghosted uh, shadow gets a little bit bigger and we're able to better see what and how our model or our project is sitting and laid out within uh, Fusion for cutting. So at this point, we'll say OK. And we have our material out here with our one part sitting in between. We're going to do um, some, we have 3D operations and two dimensional operations. We're going to take a look at our two dimensional operations because we need a profile cut on the inside of both of these uh, circles here. So we're going to do a 2D contour, which is the same as uh, VCARVE's profile. And we want to be able to select the tool. I have uh, already created a tool in uh, our tool database and we'll quickly look at this. We'll get more in depth on this on Thursday. So this is more of an overview of what we're gonna see on Thursday. Selecting the tooling. And the geometry, there is nothing selected. I'm going to select the bottom side of both of those just to get it something that we can see what's happening. I'm just going to click calculate. And here it is giving us some warning messages. And we can see that this warning is here. And um, always double click. We have our height retracts and then our pass depths. So what's happening here is the same type of issue that we ran into uh, with um, Fusion that, or with uh, Aspire, that that uh, cutter is not going to uh, fix uh, or fit uh, within there. So um, we're not, we're going to skip that for right now um, and just do a profile on the outside of this so we could see what um, the profiling uh, is going to look like. To unselect, we're just going to click that box there. Selecting the profile here and going to say OK there. So now it does give us the uh, preview. And with the lead in, lead out, <clears throat> that was really the issue that uh, we were having with being able to 
cut on the inside of those slots there. The one thing that uh, Fusion also does is uh, within the tool database, not only do we define the bit itself, we also define the tool holder and the chuck and everything else and the collets and collet nuts, everything within it, uh, that it will then warn us if we have any kind of uh, collisions uh, with, the, uh, with the part. So just to uh, get in a little bit more uh, with the uh, tool pathing, right now you see how we just created one part uh, for this. Um, and it's not really oriented, like I said, for creating multiple parts out of a sheet. Uh, about the only way that I have uh, come across to be able to make and cut multiple parts out of a job like this, um, is create another assembly uh, the same similar way that we created this assembly here although i am not going to really put it together um, so i'm going to say not saving anything there just going to go in and create a uh, new design and this is another reason that i would bring in um, and draw everything from the top down. I'm gonna warning that uh, I don't have this saved. So I'm gonna click save and call it cut layout. Now we are able to kind of drag and drop all of our product that we wanna have cut into and onto the material. So I'm gonna shift this around to fit on here and lay it out to where it is within our material. I'm not gonna go through the process of setting them all out, but remember, we have this button here, this icon here that's showing that they are linked. Even though you might think that it is a separate model that we're creating and we've separated it, they are still linked together. So if we made a change to this foot right here with a slot change, this model is also going to update to what our individual models are. Uh, so this is another reason that I like to have when creating an assembly, having extra or separate parts and not having components or a lot of components within the one main design file, although you were able to do that. So, so far we have one and two components that are still linked to external components. Again, I like to have them separate components and the reason for that again is I am able to then use this component in a multiple of different designs and it's not just linked and always locked into the main assembly. Now so this foot could be made up into the assembly one, another assembly or part uh, product and they're still all remained linked together. So at this point with them laid out running through the manufacturing process just the same way as we did originally uh, for the single part going to the manufacturing window. Now we have both of those parts that are on our layout that we're able to select. So again, going into a new setup and specifying where do you want to have the X and Y uh, link. Um, be on the product on the stock doing an offset of 0.25 and uh, I don't want any offset on the top because it's half inch thick material the parts themselves are half inch thick and we'll say okay to that so at this point we are again able to go through and do our profile uh, tool paths or facing toolpath um, the same way as we did earlier, only this time we have the options to be able to select um, both parts um, rather than just the, uh, the one part. So I know we're taking it slow uh, with uh, the, the Fusion toolpathing and all of uh, Fusion itself. There is a lot to it um, and I'm not gonna get real in depth um, with uh, this just yet. We're going to take small steps. We're going to focus most of this Thursday 
on just toolpathing the actual an actual part within Fusion from start to finish, um, and we'll see that there. So, hopefully, you guys got something out of this, um, and hopefully, everybody has had a chance to uh, download, install, and do some design work within Fusion. Um, definitely, be interested to hear what uh, everybody thinks and uh, what kind of challenges they've run into. Um, so I'm going to open it up for uh, you know kind of questions at this point. Um, so again, you could use the chat window, and at this point, everybody should be able to unmute yourself if you uh, want to speak up and ask ask a question. I have um, not done any two sided um, items within Fusion, um, but I have done uh, five axis uh, index work. Uh, within Fusion, which is uh, kind of similar to a, the, the same processes um, are needed uh, and used within uh, uh, Fusion. So we'd have multiple setups uh, within the job uh, that is, uh, has a different XYZ orientation uh, of the part. So um, right now we were looking at um, the XYZ. So if I wanted to do an index uh, machining on this, I would be able to set and have this uh, rotation or this uh, being able to rotate uh, and do another um, orientation of that X, Y, and Z to where we would say that, uh, you know, this direction, the Y is actually the Z, then that means the Z becomes the Y. Um, so that is uh, definitely a way of doing it and you're able to have multiple um, job setups uh, within uh, one setup and have them all linked together. So um, yeah, so uh, to, once you have a, a tool path uh, generated um, within uh, Fusion, let me just uh, rotate this around to actually get one in here. So now we have a, a, a tool path that's set here. I do have a warning, but we'll be okay with that. So underneath the uh, setup, uh, going to right click and create NC program. On the NC program, uh, the vendor is a ShopBot. So if we scroll down here to ShopBot tools, then we have the selected configuration. Um, we want to use the open SVP shopbot. That is the one that is going to create and save the um, uh, ads uh, shopbot code. Um, that is primarily all that we need to really focus on uh, within here. Uh, gauge length and such is uh, for uh, five axis. Um, uh, system uh, versus uh, just two axes, so we don't have to worry about that so much. At that point, unfortunately, the resolution of my screen where I'm sharing it can't be seen um, all, but down below um, the screen here, you can see it's kind of cut off, is, is the save. So fortunately, it is linked to the enter button. So I'm just going to hit the enter, which I get a um, the message, do I want to override it? Yes. And then I get a post here that says it has successfully been posted. I could click view the code and there is the cutting file that we would uh, take to the machine. We'll be here again on Thursday to see a uh, more complete start to finish uh, product um, and kind of condensed what we've done over the last three days. So. Thank you all for uh, joining us today and uh, we'll see you on Thursday.